Hello and welcome to Always an Escrow with Serena Appel and Colby Birchin. Hello, Colby. Hello, Serena. How are you? Well, I am incredibly inspired and so happy to introduce a dear friend of mine, Dana Arshin, a versatile talent and three-time Emmy winner who brings her passion for storytelling, flying trapeze, and culinary exploration to her roles as a former news anchor, Holocaust educator, and the digital creator of Chow or Never. With a deep commitment to preserving history and advocating for tolerance, she shares the powerful stories of Holocaust survivors, including those of her own family as the granddaughter of a 101-year-old Auschwitz survivor. Dana's current position with the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County allows her to continue her mission of educating and inspiring others. Dana, welcome to the show. What an introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. It's always a huge honor and a privilege to be able to talk about my work. My poppy, as you mentioned, turns 102 in March. Um, And just, yeah, I I have a lot going on in my life. I kind of can't sit still, but I feel like you both are kind of the same. Um, And I appreciate your interest in having me on. I'm super excited you're on the show. So Dana, I want tell us tell us a little bit about your journey from news anchor to becoming a Holocaust educator and then the creator of Chow or Never. Absolutely. All right. So where do I start? So I was a news reporter and a fill-in anchor um, at Fox 5 for the past six years before coming to where I am. Before that, I was a news reporter at News 12 in the Bronx and Brooklyn, where I was a one-woman show shooting, writing, narrating, driving, editing, doing everything myself, um, which I'm actually doing again now, but it's, it's I'm not on tight deadlines every day. Um, I got into this, actually, I applied for an internship in college at NBC. And I really wanted to be a writer, like behind the scenes writer for a TV show. And they called and offered me an internship in the newsroom. And I kind of panicked because I was in college. I wasn't really watching the news. I didn't know what was going on. Of course, I wasn't going to turn down an internship. Um, I took it and fell in love with news. I just loved waking up every day and not knowing where you're going to go, who you're going to meet, what you're going to learn becoming educated on a different topic every day, becoming an expert. It was just so incredibly exciting. I had never thought about being on TV, truly. Um, and fortunately, I just, I I had a natural way about me and um, it, was, it was a good fit. Um, and from there, I went to graduate school. I got my first job in News 12, which I mentioned. And it had just been a very exciting journey. I was there for 12 years in the entire industry. Um, I loved it truly, but as you might imagine, it's quite a grind. I had my second baby on the way. I was working really, really long days. I was working almost every holiday, every weekend. Um, and in this industry, there's not really like a way to get that normal schedule. It's very hard because even as I started to fill in at the anchor desk, that was on weekends. I worked this morning cut and shift, which was every weekend. So it was like, you might rise, but then you're working, you know, a weekend day or an early morning or a late night or, um, it was hard, but I don't regret a second uh, that I spent there. And I have to say, so I met Dana on site. Um, I was on location with a client of mine and we connected that day. She told that client's story. And, you know, from there we've spent time at nonprofit events. Um, we connected on uh, a shared, uh, sleepaway camp experience I'll look and back for a second. So at that camp, <laughs> is where I did flying trapeze. Uh, yes. I had an artist on Etsy make this trapeze silks uh, painting for me that's at my office now at the museum. Um, but yeah, we, we had a lot in common. And when you and I met, we just hit it off instantly. We did. And then we had a food connection too. I was working with a bunch of bakeries and restaurants and Dana would come in and, and do, do her magic and, and share. Oh, I know it's been amazing to follow you and everything that you've been doing. Uh, well, let, let's talk about the work you're doing now because your family connection to a Holocaust survivor is deeply personal. And how has this influenced your work and mission to preserve history and advocate for tolerance? My poppy was always a huge part of my life. And since I was a little girl, 
I always knew that he had a number on his arm. It was actually one of the first numbers that I memorized, 143499, and it was the tattoo that he received in Auschwitz upon arrival. And, you know, growing up, you don't really, it's hard to grasp the Holocaust. It's hard to truly understand what it is. And as I got older and older and older and learned, and I just started to um, really feel like it was an obligation of mine to keep my poppy's survival story alive and and his plight and and to keep my ancestors who were who were murdered their memories alive and when i was in grad school my like 15 minute thesis video project was actually on holocaust survivors at news 12 i did a two part series on holocaust survivors and at fox 5 I had the incredible opportunity to start basically a Holocaust series there. Um, and it was incredible because this is a local news station. It's really rare for a local news station to let me, you know, start a series on Holocaust survivors, in addition to my everyday reporting on general assignment topics. Um, and I went to Poland in 2018 and I brought my own camera and I came back and an editor worked with me and we put together three short films that aired on Fox. One of them won an Emmy Award. And I kind of just started to feel like this was my real passion, uh, you know, reporting on crime. And although the breaking news was always very exciting, I kind of got to the point in, in my life where I didn't feel like I needed to report on um, on just the happenings of, of New York City anymore. And even though it's incredibly important, I just had a different passion. So I wrote up an entire pitch of what my dream job would be. I sent it to the museum here on Long Island and they went for it and here I am. This is a really abbreviated version. Um, it took, it, I, I was working on this pitch for like two years. Um, I wasn't really ready to leave the industry and bite the bullet just yet. Um, and then finally, you know, second baby on the way. I'm like, I think this is the time to go. Wow. Yeah. That, that's that's pretty pretty empowering, like crazy that you are now doing what you love. It's it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's an obligation, but it's incredibly fulfilling. I feel like this right. is what I'm meant to be. You'll you'll are you are you a parent, Colby? I am. I have three little ones. All right. So you'll appreciate this. So, um, Serena, you know, it's women when they go into labor, it's not actually common that their water breaks and only like one in like. I don't know the exact stat, but one in many women, their water breaks. It's like, like what you see on TV is not normal. So both, <laughs> both my kids, my water broke around 5 p.m., literally within 10 minutes of 5 o'clock um, at 38 weeks to the day. Um, so exactly two weeks before, you know, full term. And um, my older daughter was born on the same day. So she shares a birthday with her namesake who's a Holocaust victim, my poppy's youngest brother named Aaron, who was seven years old, which is the craziest thing because I had been talking about this little boy for years. No one had ever been named after him. And I didn't know if I was going to have a boy or girl. And I said, you know, if she's a girl, her Hebrew name is going to be Arona after Aaron. If she's a boy, her Hebrew name will be Aaron. That was his name. And I didn't even realize till weeks later when I'm going through his birth certificate that I had gotten in Poland and we had got it translated that he was born on July 27th. And I was with my poppy as we were reading it. And I started crying. I just, I couldn't believe it. So that to me was like the first sign that, you know, this is what I'm meant to be doing. Um, second baby, I um, am about to make a speech that night because the next day is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Go into labor and give birth on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, wow. So both my babies have these like crazy Holocaust significant birthdays. And I feel like every sign in my life has pointed to, you know, me being here and this being the work that I'm meant to do. So meaningful. That's great. That's really great. Um, so can you share some of the most powerful stories of Holocaust survivors you've encountered through your work? Yes, actually, I'm glad you asked me. So um, what I, I didn't even really tell you what I do here. So I'm a storyteller. This is my latest script. Um, it's really long. I've been working on it forever. Um, I'm doing the same high quality stories that were airing on Fox 5 in this news type segment, but a news type format, I should say, but blasting them all over social media. So same stories, just a way to educate younger generations. Um and the story I'm working on right now, you know, makeup artist Bobby Brown. I'm sure you do, Serena. Yeah. yeah. She posted on her Instagram page several months ago that she's looking for a Holocaust journalist. 
Long story, what? people start tagging me. I reach out to her. And one of her best friends' um, father is a 99-year-old Holocaust survivor in Miami. So I went down to Miami. I interviewed this incre- incredible man named Jack Waxel. Um, he's my latest story. I'm really excited. But I was just telling one of my colleagues yesterday, let me, let me give you one crazy, crazy story from him. So he was, he survived multiple Nazi um, forced labor camps, but one of the most incredible things I've ever heard is that he was in a lineup of 50 men and they were all standing over a ditch to be shot one by one into the ditch. So as they're getting closer to him, he figures he has nothing to lose. And he and his friend who are in the lineup together his name is Chaim. I'll give him a shout out to keep his memory alive. Um, he and his friend Chaim just start tackling one of the Nazi officers behind him, and they all three fall into the ditch. So the Nazi officer screams, don't shoot, don't shoot, stop shooting, because he doesn't want to get shot. So at that point, Chaim and this survivor, Jack, start running in every direction to try to get out of in opposite directions to get out of the ditch. They're shooting at them. And just about 10 feet away is the forest. Um, Chaim gets shot and killed. Jack makes his way out of the ditch, runs into the forest, was the only one of those 50 men to survive the lineup and lived alone in the forest for the next month. I have chills. Yeah, and I get stories like that all the time. I could interview 10 Auschwitz survivors and each story is different. Um, I interview survivors in person every week, by the way. Um, I was doing up to three a week and I scaled it back down to one because mentally I, it was very hard for me to handle it. Um, but I, you know, I also feel like this sense of time is running out and I need to get them on. I put that pressure on myself. Um, but now I'm kind of at the point where like I could handle what I can handle and week by week I'll do another survivor. Um, but it's hard. I'm, I'm always wrestling with that, you know, with my obligation to get as many as possible, but I don't feel like my interviews are as strong when I've done so many in the week. So, um, that's what I'm going with, but yeah, my poppy has an amazing story. He survived more than two years in Auschwitz. Uh, Joseph Mengele, the notorious Nazi doctor, selected him to work. Um, I interviewed two um, Mengele twins. They were twins who Joseph Mengele experimented on. Most of them were murdered. Uh, They both survived. Um, Every story is truly just remarkable, and they're all so unique and so different. Wow. For you to have the capacity to do this, it's it's so extraordinary and brilliant. So let's just... Let's switch gears for a quick minute, okay? Let's lighten up the mood mm-hmm. and go talk about flying trapeze, an unusual passion of yours. How did you get started with it, and how does it complement your other interests and in professional pursuits? So I was really, you know, fortunate that my parents were able to send me to sleepaway camp, you know, when I was younger. And I remember we looked at a bunch of different camps. We knew someone that had gone to Camp Lohican. And when we went to look, it was at that. Now, I think having flying trapeze at camp is a little more common, but still not that common. Um, Then there were very few camps that had a trapeze. And I saw and I was like, it was calling me. And I was like, I need to go here. Um, My sister wound up going before me. She was a few years older. And then I went after her. And like my first day at camp, I wound up doing the trapeze. I went to this camp for 11 summers, by the way, as a staff member and camper, I wound up being one of the run, like being one of the co, um, I don't know what they call it. I, I was running the trapeze um, at, at, in grad school. So I went through literally like elementary school through, through parts of college and graduate school. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with it. You know, it's very free, freeing and it's a full body workout, literally fingertips to toes. Um, and I just kind of kept it up. I started teaching classes at trapeze school in New York and in New York city, where I was teaching very sporadically, maybe one class a month, but I did it for about a decade, uh, just kind of to keep it up. And now I actually take classes. Um, I go in on Sunday nights whenever I can to Brooklyn, um, I was just there this past Sunday and it's just kind of my unique hobby that I love. Wow. Truly. Truly. <laughs> Did you ever do trapeze at camp? I can't remember if it was there, but I know I've tried it and it's, it's really such a challenge for me. I mean, there's so much strength involved. I I'm definitely tempted to join you in Brooklyn and try it again. 
Shit. Oh my God. So like my, like this whole, it's called like the trapezius muscle. Cause no one ever uses that in any type of other sport or in real life. So like for weeks, like from here down to my stomach just kills. Um, and then, and then you get used to it and, and you feel like you're building that unique muscle that no one else has. My kids do it at camp and my one, one of my sons is scared to death of it. He's like, do I have to do it? I'm like, you don't have to do it, but I would do it. And then my little girl who just turned six, she she's a badass. She loves it. I'm going to turn a little gear to another shift a little bit for you. So as a three-time Emmy winner, could you tell us about some of your most memorable moments in your television career? Oh, I don't even, it's, you know, people ask me this question a lot. It's so hard because I was at a point where sometimes, especially at News 12, sometimes I would do three stories a day. Um, at Fox 5 on the evening shift, I would always do two stories a day. Can you imagine that? 12 years of multiple stories a day. Um, you know, the ones that stand out are like the fun ones, right? Like I would, oh, and Fox was really cool. Anything I pitched that I was super passionate about that was you know, possible to have a crew for, they let me do. So I used to do stories on Ringling Brothers every year at News 12 and at Fox. So I would show off some of my circus skills and I love being with the performers. That was really fun. I went cross country skiing on an assignment. Um, obviously all my Holocaust survivors, but when it comes down to it, it was truly telling everyday New Yorker stories that was incredible to me, like how Serena and I first met. Like every person has such a unique story. And I feel like I got to kind of hear a perspective from every part of the city, um, from the Bronx to Staten Island to Brooklyn. Um, it, w- it was amazing. So, you know, it's really hard to pick one thing, but the overall experience of kind of just getting to know the city and the people inside and out made the industry very unique. It was so wonderful to see you, you know, kind of rise from reporter to anchor. And you were also, I think, going live too at certain points, you know, kind of like giving a behind the scenes of what it was like. And I just loved it because it was that, you know, peak behind the scenes like that you usually don't get. Just, I, I do want to be clear. I was a fill-in anchor. So I did have, in my last year, I had, I had the chance to actually solo anchor some newscasts, which is very special. And then on Saturday mornings, I did something called the cut and shift where I would sit and do all the headline news um, every Saturday. And that was great. But I, I do want to be clear with my titles. Um, but no, it was, it was incredible to have that experience. It really was. And it was incredible to see you in that chair, you know, from like, you know, stand up outside of a different, you know, location when you were on location and then you're pretty much in the studio. So um, I loved to see that that all happen and, and follow along along the way. Yeah. And I've seen you rise and take on so many incredible uh, you know, different businesses that you represent through your PR company. It's amazing. And Colby, I don't know much about, you said you're in real estate. I do. I do a luxury real estate all over South Florida. And, right. um, and now we dabble in podcasting, which has taken, we've done very well with. So, uh, but it's, you know, I, I love what I do. I'm very, I'm very blessed. Can you offer any advice for young professionals that are looking to make a meaningful impact in the fields of storytelling and education or media? Yes. So I have a real, you know, there are a lot of um, moms and I hate to say that it's only moms, but it is um, in the news industry who have been reaching out to me because they've seen what I've done and they really want to be this full time working professional. Um, But they're struggling how to balance such a demanding career And they wanted my opinion on if they were to ever leave the news industry, how would they be able to still keep that skill set, skill set, that unique skill set you get? Um, And my opinion, my my advice is that. All right, so I'll, I'll give you an example. I was speaking at an event a few months ago about my my Holocaust storytelling, and someone came up to me from a pretty well known tech company that you guys would have definitely heard of. And he said, I want to hire you as our first ever storyteller. He's like, the position doesn't exist, but I want to create it. And I was like, thank you. That sounds amazing. I said, I can't even really discuss it because I'm doing my dream job right now. And I have an obligation to my survivors. Like, this is truly all I want to do is tell their stories. Um, I mean, I wrote up this dream job, right? And at this point, it's not about money. It's about doing work that 
is important and fulfilling and what I know my ancestors would be proud of me to do. Um, but I still went for lunch with this guy and I was curious to hear his thoughts. And I came out of that realizing that every single industry needs a storyteller. This is a position that can be created anywhere, right? Any company, whether it be a doctor's office, a dentist's office, a supermarket, a huge tech company, a Holocaust museum, everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has an employee who's been working there for 30 years or who just survived cancer or, I mean, the sky's the limit or a dentist's office. How nice would it be to profile a different family every month um, and do a story on their life? And what makes, so I, I'm encouraging people to create your own positions because my position didn't exist. I created it, right? I said, I want to be a storyteller. Here's what I'm going to bring to the table. Everyone has a social media platform. So how does a random a paint company, right? How do they get in follower? And I say paint as I look at my purple walls, like how, how would they build their social media following? Well, how cool would it be to have a storyteller who's like, I'm here with a painter who paints a hundred homes a month. And this is what goes into painting and, and seeing like his muscles that are building from it, the color selection, how he gets excited by, and you could just see the wheels spinning in my head. I never even thought of this before, but everyone has a story to tell and everyone could be profiled in some way. And that's just an amazing way to build up a business. So my advice to the last, you know, journalist I spoke to, I was like, well, you know, I'm passionate about Holocaust. I could also be a trapeze storyteller or food storyteller. Like I have so many things I love, but what are you passionate about? Maybe it is art and painting. You know, find a way to create that position for yourself. Even you in real estate, like it would be cool to have a reporter do a story on you or do a story. And I see a lot of realtors doing that now, actually making these videos of, you know, what comes with the property and walking distance to town, um, right? But you guys are getting into that field and just, the sky is the limit. Um, yeah. And I'm always the type of person with a backup plan. I'm like, well, if this didn't work out, um, what would I do? And like, I live in the town of Port Washington. I'm like, I think I'd want to be the Port Washington storyteller where I do different news stories on all the different businesses on Main Street. Like, I just have all these ideas in my head. Um, so my number one advice always is write up your dream job. And if it doesn't exist, create it. Someone will hire you. I don't know how long it will take or who it's going to be, but someone will see your passion and will hire you. I really believe that. I agree with that. I actually do agree with that. So I want to know more about Chow or Never. Literally, I am such a foodie and I look at your your Instagram page and I'm like, oh my God, I need to go here. I need to go there. I can't get enough of it. Thank you so much. Well, first I'll tell you how I came up with the name. Me and my husband, I don't know, I don't think we were married then. We've been together for 12 years. Um, we, my, my boyfriend at the time, I guess, he and I were walking through the East Village on a, a snowy day and we would spend, when we first started dating, my husband and I, we would spend so much time sending each other like different restaurants and hole in the walls and like the best burger joint. And like, it didn't have to be fancy. It didn't matter, but we would go all over the city exploring every borough. And I was like, you know what? And food vlogs didn't really exist then. Now there's like a million, it's totally saturated. Um, but I was like, we're spending not only so much money, but so much time and research. I'm like, why don't I just start like documenting it on Instagram just so we can also remember and share with our friends. So we're coming up with a name and I was you know, saying like eats and this and chow and this. And I was like, I'm like, now or never, chow or never. And my husband was like, oh, it's a little cheesy. I'm like, no, that's it. Chow or never. That's my name. Um, and then I create this is, I don't, oh my God, this has to be like 10 years ago already. Um, I was at one point posting three times a day. It was crazy. Now I post like once every few weeks. I really, uh, I go through phases, but it's very hard with everything I'm juggling right now. Um, but I was never trying to get free meals, anything like that. I just were doing it for fun. And then I just organically hit 5,000 followers. And I, that was like the magic number. I started getting invites from restaurants and restaurant owners saying, can you come? We'll offer you a comped meal. I want you to take pictures. And, um, and like to some people, someone's like, that's so easy. You just have to take pictures. Um, but I got really into my photography. You know, I would I would have like a slow mo of like cheese dripping down or whatever it was. I got really into it, 
And I was just honest that you could tell how excited I get when I talk about my, my friend says I can convince anyone to eat anything just by like how excited I get talking about it. Um, and then it just grew. I have, I don't know, 20, 22,000 followers, something like that. Um, but what's funny is that my Dana page, my like Holocaust news page has half the amount of followers, but so much more engagement. I think a lot of people with food, they like to see it and they save it and then they keep scrolling. No one's commenting like, ooh, that pizza looks amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm always actually trying to figure out like the Instagram algorithm too. But no, it's it's been great. Obviously with two kids, it's been harder to experiment now. Um, but a realtor, speaking of realtors again, recently just, see, this was, this was unique idea from them. They started every Friday, like profiling different foodies and getting all their recommendations on Long Island where I live. So she had me like really sit down and think, and I wrote up like a whole list of like local recommendations, um, that I just posted on my page, but it's fun. I love it. Um, I have to work out a lot to eat that much, but. Well, you're amazing. It's you. You are really so incredible, powerful, energized. You've energized this conversation for sure. And let's wrap it up and tell people how they can follow along. Okay. And, you know, learn more about the work that you're doing currently and um, how they can also get involved. Thank you so much for asking. So any chance I have to talk about my 101-year-old poppy, my inspiration, and the work that I'm doing, I will take it. So we are here on Long Island in Glen Cove. It's Long Island's only Holocaust Museum and Educational Center. It's called the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. We call it HMTC for short. So me, as the storyteller, I go around interviewing survivors and I post their stories online, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but we also work, my education team here works with every single school, not every single school district, but so many school districts all across Long Island, teaching them about the dangers of anti-Semitism, but not just anti-Semitism, bullying and hate of all kinds. We teach tolerance and understanding. Um, you can learn about us just by going to hmtcli.org. If you go to backslash stories, you'll see all of my stories. Um, follow me on social media, Dana Arshin, A-R-S-C-H-I-N, and H-M-T-C-L-I. You can find it basically all across um, social media platforms as well. Um, we always need money. I hate to put it out there, but we're a nonprofit. Um, most of our funding goes to actually transportation, taking Holocaust survivors to and from schools and events so that they can speak. Um, and obviously the events that we put on to try to raise awareness and um, and making sure that we all keep our jobs so that we can continue to educate. So um, if you're ever thinking of a cause, please donate to us. We'd really appreciate it. And reach out to me anytime. Um, I love meeting new people. And um, I got a really beautiful message this week. I got a few messages this week. I get a lot of hate messages too. You know, um, Holocaust never happened and deniers. And, you know, I try to just I used to respond and now I don't. I just ignore. Um, but I got some really beautiful messages this week from someone who said, please thank your parents. They did something right. It's so rare to see someone reporting from their roots um, as a human. That was really nice. Someone else said that they moved to the suburbs of Philly and they've been following me and they grew up here and, and, and they are so proud that I you know, publicly promote Um my work. And, and it's just so nice when I get that. So that keeps me going. Um, so yes, reach out to me. That was a long way of saying, I like hearing from you. Um, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. I will tell you, you, you are right. That letter someone wrote to you this week that you are doing from your roots. I mean, that is true. A lot of, you know, younger generation, they don't. And I love that you do it. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. And that's why I'm what I'm trying to do is on these platforms. A lot of people from older generations are like, well, I'm not on Instagram. I'm like, but you're not the ones I need to educate right now. Right. You want these stories to live on. And that's with young people. Yes, it starts there. Thank you for inspiring our community and the masses. Thanks for coming on our show, Dana. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Love you guys. Um, thank you. Uh, it's been so amazing just to be your friend over the years. Colby, my new friend, I'll visit you in Boca in a few weeks. 100%. We'll go on the trapeze together. <laughs> I'm down for it. Right. Thank you. Thank you.